I think it's part of the answer of what God is doing about the problem of pain and suffering. If we understand that evil, pain, and suffering uh, follow naturally from the kind of world that God created with morally free creatures, and this is certainly a possibility, and as it turns out, in our case, an eventuality, um, the question isn't, why doesn't God stamp out the evil right now? He's patient and long-suffering. That's why. That comes later. The question might be asked, well, what is God doing about it now? Well, he's doing a lot, actually. And one of the things he's done is he's given us institutions, three of them in particular, that help mitigate the impact of evil in the world. He's given the government, he's given the family, and he's given the church. When the government and the family and the church are operating according to God's principles, the way he intends them to operate, then there's less evil in the world. It's just that simple. When any of those are not doing their job or are prevented from doing their job, like the erosion of family as a result of the culture of government would be an example, uh, well, then there's going to be more evil in the world, and this is quantifiable. So that's one of the things that God is doing. Insofar as I'm a follower of Christ and member of a community of other followers of Christ, then there is some obligation that I have to have an impact on the world for good and to mitigate the impact of evil in the world. Well, this is the question, isn't it? And, and I think there's kind of an interesting answer to this. And when I give it, I don't think it's going to be so mysterious. This kind of implies that people make decisions for rational reasons only. And if you give them a good rational argument, then the rational reasons prevail. If you've got the better argument, of, of course the people are going to believe in you. They don't believe in you, the, the majority, therefore you must not have the better argument. But the fact is, it is actually quite rare that people make their decisions based on rational reasons. Rather, people make their decisions based on other things. A lot of people make their decisions based on emotional reasons. Uh, they may have had bad experiences. They may have uh, bad experiences with people of, say, the Christian religious group. They may have good experiences with people of another religious group. They, they, uh, they may have family connections and family ties that make it very, very difficult for them to make a change of religion. There are all kinds of emotional reasons that compel people to believe and decide the way they do. Um, I mean, if you think about your own experience, I'm sure there's plenty of times you realize that was not smart what that person did, but I understand why they did it. Not because they were thinking carefully, but because they were reacting. There was an emotional thing going on. So you have rational reasons. You also have emotional reasons. You also have prejudicial reasons. Uh, sometimes people have never considered any other options, and they're not interested in it. They, they think with blinders on. They are genuinely narrow-minded in that they're not willing to consider any other ideas outside of their own camp. They've made up their mind before the facts are in. They're prejudiced for their own view and against others. And so that influences them to make the wrong decision when some other decision would be, would be brighter, would be smarter. And finally, the fourth reason is hey, some people are just bullheaded. And you know what I'm talking about? And when it comes to religious issues, I think the hardest thing for people to do is to bend the knee. They do not want to bend the knee. I understand that. I didn't want to bend the knee for 23 years. That's human nature, fallen human nature. And sometimes it's not rational reasons. Sometimes it's not emotional reasons. Sometimes it's not prejudicial reasons. Sometimes it's just plain old stubbornness and rebellion that keep people from doing the smart thing. When I think back in my own development as a, as a follower of Christ and as a, as a Christian thinker, the book that stands out most as having the greatest impact is probably C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. It's a little bitty book. I read it when I was uh, first a Christian. And uh, it was written, written almost 80 years ago. However, the way Lewis approaches problems um, is, is clever because he not only thinks carefully through the issues, he's nuanced, he reflects, and he helps you to see that Christianity is worth thinking about. But he, he helps you to do that in a way that's very accessible, I think, to the rank and file. And so it taught me a bit how to think about Christianity and that, that, that you could have thinking regarding the claims of, the, of Christianity. Um, and also a little bit about how to uh, communicate that to those who have a different view. And he, he's very ironic. He's very friendly. Um, he, he, he's very thoughtful, but he can turn a phrase. 
And all of these things have influenced me, and I actually go back to Lewis frequently, not just that book, but other of his writings, that, uh, it, that, that uh, because they help me um, kind of capture a, 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 an important point in a very tight uh, sentence, if you will. He's very quotable in that regard, and so he's a great example for that kind of thing.